day has finally come guys the backhoe is officially out of commission I think this problem probably has been the most persistent of all the problems that we have dealt with since we bought this backhoe two years ago to help us on the house build we did have some early issues and some of those were kind of a head scratcher but the service manual that we purchased which is comprehensive huge manual uh, helped us get through some of that stuff. If you haven't seen those videos, jump back. We had the alternator that was giving us fits. I'm not even kidding. It turned out to be a 50 cent light bulb that was keeping the alternator from working. If that confuses you, watch that video. It had me stumped too. We've had other little things along the way, like we lost the uh, throttle connector when we were plowing one day, uh, little stuff like that. This one has been a ghost. And probably back in the spring, so a few months ago, I decided to tear into this thing and we replaced the switches for the cutout, the clutch cutout on the loader arm. We did not replace the one on the shifter. What these allow you to do is to push this button and then you can rev the engine to use the hydraulics and um, it makes them work faster. And then when you need to, you just let go of the switch and now you can drive again. If you didn't have that switch, the tractor would be trying to drive while you're trying to operate whatever, the bucket or whatever, and that would be super annoying. Anyway, this has been giving us fits for a long time. Basically, the symptom is that you come out, start the backhoe, you put it into drive, nothing happens. You check that it's in gear, it's in gear, you check that it's in forward, whatever. And what tipped me off to kind of what the cause was or the, the problem was, one day I was out here monkeying with it, trying to get it to work, and what we used to do is basically bang the bucket up and down, like bounce the bucket. <laughs> it seemed to work. I remember when this happened, I used to actually pull with the, the backhoe arm trying to get everything to work. Anyway, I came out here one day trying to figure out what's going on because we're trying to use the backhoe and it won't move. And I put it in reverse and the backup beeper didn't come on. That one is what kind of tipped me off to what was happening. I didn't have the answer right away, so I started reading the service manual and it led me down here under the floorboard. What, it, what happens down here is there's a solenoid that when you push this clutch cutout switch, it basically opens or changes a valve down there that keeps the, the backhoe from moving in the direction that the shuttle shift is in. But it happens to also be related to the reverse sensor here. I'm using layman's terms, sorry, it's not very technical. But anyway, when this problem is happening, the backup beeper doesn't come on. And that told me we probably have an issue down here. Alyssa's dad was visiting back in the spring and I, he said, do you need any help with anything? I said, yeah, can you figure out why this stinking thing won't work reliably? <laughs> he said, we should just call the 1-800 number. <laughs> I told him there isn't one. Thankfully, I have a friend who's a case mechanic who's been very generous and let us text him and talk to him on the phone, and he's helped me diagnose many of the problems that have been happening with the backhoe. This one, though, uh, he kind of pointed me in the right direction, but in a nutshell, Alyssa's dad actually solved the problem, which gave him a boost of confidence that he can fix a backhoe. So as we started to poke and prod down here with electrical meters and stuff like that, trying to find something that was, was awry, we ended up finding this four pin connector that is a harness and one of the wires actually goes to the clutch cutout switch. I guess I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Back in the spring, we replaced this switch on the loader arm and the wiring down to the harness thinking that this might have been the culprit. When we did that, we found out that there's a little rubber boot that goes on top to keep water from getting in the switch and that boot was missing. So we thought that was the problem. We replaced it and it started working. We figured we had it solved only to find out later it's not solved at all. So kind of back to where I was with Alyssa's dad, we started poking around in here and pushing and pulling on wires and we found that the, the wire that goes to the clutch cutout switch was actually pulled back in the harness ever so slightly. 
That little tiny bit of bad contact was all that was keeping this massive 15,000 pound machine from moving. So we tried doing some little things like uh, removing the pin, bending the ears, putting the pin back in. We kind of did all the basic troubleshooting and we got it to work, but it seems like this problem just keeps resurfacing. And the reason it's a major problem is you come out here to use the backhoe and it won't move. And you don't know if it'll be five minutes or an hour before you can get it to do what it needs to do. So I put my sister on this job because she was here recently. <laughs> I've been busy doing other stuff. She started into this and basically we kind of ran into a roadblock. I had purchased the parts at a local uh, automotive store to fully rebuild this harness and I was shocked how much they charge for this stuff. I think I got ripped off, I'll be honest with you. It seems like it's outrageous for what it is, but I guess I don't really know how these things work. But anyway, so I gave her the parts to rebuild this and she started tearing things apart trying to make a new harness and Turns out you need to have the right tools to do this type of work. In trying to put the harness together, we couldn't get the pin that goes inside the harness crimped correctly, and therefore it wouldn't go into the little harness doohickey. It just wouldn't work. And she has spent several hours out here trying to bend it with needle nose pliers and crimpers and all this stuff. What happened is, I guess I realized it's time for me to step up my connector game. You know, we put these LED lights on a couple winters ago. They've been fantastic, but a lot of them have uh, automotive harnesses on them. And I kind of got by using needle nose pliers. We, we somehow got the harnesses to work. And I don't remember them being at all poorly done. So anyway, something worked there that's not working here. So I figured it's time to invest in the right tools to do this type of job right. And I think it'll make me feel better when I can fix these harnesses and get them watertight the way they should be. I don't know that much about automotive harnesses, but from what I can tell, there's maybe a couple of basic brands. This is called a Weatherpack brand, and you probably have seen these types of harnesses before. They're very common in automotive applications, and they allow you basically to crimp one of these little pins onto the wire, and then a boot is added to weather pack or weather seal the back end of the connector and then the connector itself has this little rubber boot that keeps water out of the inside of the connection. It seems overly complicated, but I guess what do I know about this stuff? The other one is what's called the Deutsch connector. This is actually a weather pack system. The Deutsch connector is very similar um, but it requires a completely unique set of pins and tools and everything. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, but you know I was working with what I had but when we put these lights on here, we actually used butt connectors and things up inside the subframe, figuring it was probably weather protected, but let's both be honest, that's probably not gonna last a long time. So I'm, part of what I'm trying to achieve is to find the right tools and everything to do this job correctly. What prompted me to invest in the weather pack system versus going with the Deutsch connector is that it seems like the weather pack is super common. Um, some of the two pin connectors that we have up here they're not a waterproof connection. I, I, that's the best I could think of at the time. But now that I've been going through this stuff and I keep running into these stinking connectors, I realize maybe it's time that we do this right. So I've got this system. I basically have bought these little connectors down at the automotive store and I paid almost as much for one connector at the, at the automotive store as I did for this whole entire kit. So that's what tells me that either they're ripping people off or I don't know, something weird's going on with the pricing. So having this kit around, I think it's gonna be easier when we run into one of these connectors or an application where having a waterproof connection uh, is important. We're gonna have all the right tools to do it right the first time. We put this really expensive light bar on the backhoe. It was really just an interesting case study in whether the cheap light bars or expensive light bars are better. And I guess if you wanna see what happened, watch the video, it was really interesting to me I can say confidently there's a massive difference between the cheap and expensive light bars, but that doesn't mean that everybody has a budget to buy a thousand dollar light bar, right? So these lights are the ones that we decided to leave on here, and you can see that that is a weather pack fitting, right? But this guy right here, nope, that's not waterproof at all. And then I've got butt connectors right there, which again are just not waterproof. Not, not good, right? But that was the best I had at the time. We needed to get everything up and going for winter to be able to plow, and it'll feel really good to get another weather tight connection. And just make sure this stuff's weatherproof because the backhoe stays out here all year round. 
I actually still have a few LED lights lay, laying around that I want to get installed on the backhoe and then also on our excavator. The lights that are on the back of the backhoe are still the halogens and because of the current draw we can't run those and the LEDs in the front at the same time without blowing a fuse. So it'd be nice to get more light in the back uh, come winter when things are just dark outside. Uh, but we want to make sure that we can get those connectors done right. So this feels like a good investment. If you've ever tried to install or remove one of these things with a pair of needle nose pliers, there's a lot going on here. There's this little tiny collar here. And then this bigger collar, I believe, is actually supposed to crimp on these little boots onto the wire to keep them from falling off and to help improve the water tightness of the connection. If you've tried to do that with a pair of needle nose pliers, you know it probably won't work. And the barrels on these connectors are intentionally very tight tolerances, I think for waterproofing. And if you don't crimp that guy correctly, it just won't fit in here. And I guess you could, I guess you could just do it a, a, a brutal way and make it work, but I guess it's nice when things fit the way they're supposed to and work like they're supposed to. So it looks to me like in this kit, they include quite a few single barrel connectors. So that's kind of cool. So if you just need a single connection, I guess that makes sense because how would you waterproof one of these if it didn't have a wire in it, right? And they include a few, three, well, there's one, three. So there's a four square. This is a four flat. So that's what we need to repair our harness. And then here's quite a few. Looks like there's a few two flats. And then here's just a bunch more single barrels. So a little bit of an assortment. I guess I thought there was probably more pieces, but it looks like they're using all of these to do what everybody does, inflate the piece count of these kits. And then it looks like this, this crimper is actually um, a single crimper that can do multiple gauges, which is a whole nother problem. The wire size variation is can be substantial. And if you don't have the right size pins, you actually can't get the wire in there to crimp. And so having one tool might not be the best. So they actually have interchangeable dies that go inside here that allow you to crimp different sizes of pins for the different sizes of wires. I guess before I get too far ahead of myself and getting too excited about all this stuff, I think we should try to see if we can get this wire harness repaired uh, properly. And if that goes well, well, I guess that will give me the confidence to do some of these other harnesses uh, that need to be repaired as well. Oh, nice. Looks like they actually include their removal tool also for removing these connectors, which is a whole, whole new challenge. Now, this is a little frustrating. Just kind of reading through the instructions here. They list a lot of this stuff in metric, which, man, doesn't this battle happen every time? So they show that the certain jaws are for 22, 20, and 18 um, size wire, but they show everything in metric. And so this whole bin is organized in metric sizing. So this is actually one size of boot, different size of boot, and a third size of boot. And same thing with these connectors. So these connectors go with these boots, these with these boots, and so on, which is fine. I think it's just challenging to try to interpolate or extract what's, what size. So there's a little marking right here on the jaws that shows this is for a one to two millimeter and three millimeter. I don't know about you guys, but I don't really know what millimeter wire I'm using. So I'm kind of using this information here to extract what that is. So it looks like three millimeter is actually number 12 wire. And then one to two millimeter is 14 to 16 wire. It's kind of annoying. Maybe I'll mark some of this stuff a little bit better. That way, when I need to do a kit, I don't have to try to remember what millimeters and wire sizes uh, line up with what. All right, well, I guess let's just give it a go. So I think we're working with 14 wire. So let's go, let's go this route. So there's a boot and a connector, and we need the one to two die, which works perfect. All right, I think we'll start a connector graveyard right here. These are the ones that we've been trying to do that we basically have ruined. Something tells me that did not work. Well, it got the first part and it got that part, but it didn't get the whole connector. So what happened there? There we go. Well, it 
It's not perfect. It's better than we were able to do with the needle nose. It looks like the boot didn't get crimped correctly and I had to double crimp that. Let's see if it'll actually fit in the connector. Nope, won't go in. There we go. So this tool actually crimps both the boot here and the wire in the same crimp. It has two locations on the die. I don't know if you can see that, but there's kind of a wide spot for the boot and a skinny spot for the wire. But it didn't, it wasn't perfect. So I crimped it a couple extra times trying to get what I thought should be there. And it was a little difficult to get it into that connector, which we'd been having that problem before because we'd mangled these connectors so bad. Um, but I finally got it, it went. So that's one wire down. Uh, let's see if we can get these three into there. If so, we can plug this guy back in and hopefully our backhoe's up and running. Another one that's kind of ish. Definitely something right there that does not allow the wire to go in. I feel like I'm just smunching it, like it's not what we're supposed to do, I don't think. Same problem as the other one. I not want to go. Those little ears right there are what keep that thing from going in there. It's not gonna go, like, now what? It's not in, it's not out. I don't think that's what you're supposed to do, but it's the only way I seem to be able to get these stupid pins to go in this thing. And like that, it's in. Yep, that's exactly what's keeping that. But the problem is when you bend those ears down, now they go too far. Let's see if this one will go in. Nope. So is my boot like the wrong boot or something? Glad we got the removal tool. In the interest of really screwing this up, let's crimp that so it'll go in there. So now the boots are all the way in there. Well, I think I screwed this up, guys. So right here, there's two little wings and those were what keep the connector from pulling out, the pin from pulling out of the connector. And then there's two little wings right here that I think keep it from sliding forward in the connector. And then you crimp here and here to crimp the boot and the wire. Well, that almost confirms what I was suspecting. Boy, that boot doesn't look right at all, does it? So what ends up happening is you crimp it about here, but those little um, ridges are too far back. Yep, that's exactly what's going on. So here's the boots that are included with this kit, which I was supposed to use and I didn't. And let's compare that to the boot that's right here. So I ended up bending those little ears down to make the pin go in, but I think they're kind of important. And if we pull, well, I guess it's probably not gonna have a lot of strain on that connector. I was thinking if you pulled on that, the pins might come out far enough that the boots won't do their job. Yeah, like that. So that, that boot is sticking out too far and it's not really sealing the end of that connector. So I guess I'm realizing that the boots that I purchased at the auto parts store maybe aren't even for this connector I don't I don't guess I don't know so I guess let's take this apart and we'll take those connectors off I guess and we'll just do this right That worked out so much better. It actually looks right. That seal's kind of sitting right on the outside edge. It's not quite tucked in. And the pin looks like it's at the proper depth. So that's definitely, definitely what was wrong. This connector or this pin actually goes back here right at the heel of the boot. And when that's done, the depth is set correctly for the pin to slide in. It's all one big system, obviously, and something as little as the wrong boot makes the whole thing just fall apart. Kind of looking at the original factory harness, we can see how the boots are kind of sitting right at the surface. They shouldn't be sticking out, but they also shouldn't really be 
recessed at all. That makes sense. I feel like we're we're on the right track here. So let's get this whole thing built and then we'll test it and see if it actually works. It's kind of funny. I feel like the same thing is happening as before. So maybe maybe the fundamental issue is that this gray wire is slightly shorter than the others. I guess it makes sense that you'd want those wires to be the same length. Like this white one is horrendously long compared to the others. And I feel like this pin for the gray wire is for some reason, it's just like a 16th, maybe an eighth of an inch pushed back in there. And it's like, it doesn't want to stay forward. It wants to slide back. Although this side of the connector looks fine. So let's bend this down so it'll support the wires and let's, let's plug it in, I guess. And we'll just, we'll know right away. I mean, the real issue has been that that pin slid back in the connector and it just wasn't making a great connection. Maybe we'll have to take this all back apart and make those wire lengths uniform. That's how it is on this side. But this side of the connector looks like maybe it's been repaired before. <laughs> this running we'll let it warm up a little bit I think if we push that wire forward I'll bet it'll work nothing well I have been monkeying down here for probably 20 minutes and I've deduced that we've solved this problem but uh, doesn't seem like we've solved the problem so I guess there's always that chance that Maybe there really never was a problem with this connector. I spent some time taking these connectors apart and just verifying that there's continuity here and here. And I don't even know what this is. It seems like it's a dead end. I don't think it's a resistor of any kind, but I guess I could be wrong. Uh, anyway, I took this apart and, and tried to find continuity there. Seems like, I, I can't tell you why, but when I took this apart, everything started working. So. Let's let's see if we can get it to work. I think that's the problem. I'm not sure why though. That's a mystery. So I feel pretty confident this is solved. Um, I've definitely got um, continuity back here to up here. Everything's good, so every the connections are definitely being made. But it seems like maybe in this little guy, it's pretty corroded. And I think that's probably because it's not a watertight connection. In fact, this connection looks a lot like the ones that I that I put on there on our LED lights. It's just a two-prong, just a two-prong connector. This guy down here looks like it's in pretty bad shape. It's in looks pretty corroded. So for some reason removing this seemed to make everything work. So I guess it's time to go back to the drawing board. But as far as this video is concerned, we got this connector replaced and I think that there was an issue there. And wouldn't you know it, right there is another weather pack connector. So there may come a point in time where we have to replace that one, but we'll kind of wait and diagnose things as we go and see if we can figure out if it's something else. So black and yellow goes to ground. White and blue should have 12 volts coming into pin B of connector G. And then here's the shift handle connector. So that is white and blue also. And then here's the clutch cutout solenoid. Well, they don't show the gray wires that come after this, this clutch cutout solenoid. There's actually gray wires in here. So I guess we can't diagnose that right now because we don't have a schematic of what's happening there. All right, after doing tons of testing and using the owner's manual or the service manual, I was not able to get the voltage that I'm supposed to have at the white and blue wire. And I figured out why. Little fuse. 
I'm not sure when that got blown, but that would explain why the return or the clutch cutout is not working now. So that doesn't explain why the solenoid wasn't kicking in because basically what happens is when you push this button right here you're actually exciting or adding voltage to the circuit which I think disables the solenoid or actuates the solenoid I should say which disables the the shuttle shift so let's get a new fuse and then hopefully we'll have this guy working again because right now the backhoe works but the clutch cutout doesn't one thing after another right Nope. So now the backhoe moves, but our clutch cutout switch is no longer working. Well, that explains it. That fuse already blew. So it looks like we might have a short or something in the system that's not working. Hmm. That's really strange. I heard this fuse pop when I pushed this button over here. Isn't that weird? So that's not good. Going on a couple hours trying to diagnose this situation and this is the weirdest thing. Everything was working fine before we pulled apart the harness. It's so weird. I've isolated the switches. I've isolated the harnesses. It's ridiculous the, the links I've gone to to find what's causing this situation. So I think I'm going to give up for now. I'm hoping my friend will give me a call back and, and talk it over with me and see if he has any bright ideas about what's weird. Um, I've looked the harness over. I've, I'm pretty sure everything is exactly the way it came out. It wouldn't matter because I've isolated that harness anyway, so it's not the harness, like if that makes any sense. So now we have a new problem. I'm almost to the point where I think that we have a chafed harness or chafed wire or something that is shorting out because I can get everything to work fine when it's just sitting here. So I can actually get the clutch cutout switch to work. The solenoid works, everything works. As soon as I start the engine and do that, I think the vibration or whatever is causing whatever is shorting out to short out and is blowing that fuse. So now I've gone through that many fuses trying to figure this out. All right, so I guess I'm gonna table that problem. Didn't even know I had when I started this. And I'll start working on getting these up here finished up. I think that's the one thing that I wanted to accomplish today was using these uh, connectors and getting good and getting some of this stuff tidied up. So let's shift gears. So this can come off and then we'll drop this weather pack here. And looks like black is black and white is red. Okay, so we can just get rid of those two, weather pack that and be done. to find a length of wire probably to replace that. We'll pull this weather pack off, we'll cut it there, and we'll just build kind of our own little harness that'll get us up around to here. What's going on here? Something fishy here. What's this? Because this isn't... Oh, there we go. So that's the wire size I thought I was grabbing. Looks like we got solder joints in here. Oh, well that wasn't crimped anyway. <laughs> All kinds of problems. All right, time to start over. Huh, it's 
better. It's still fugly, but it's better. Well, I'd say this is a success. A couple things that I learned crimping that stuff. One, you have to put the connector on the right direction. Detail. <laughs> Couldn't figure out how the stupid connector wouldn't go on. Turns out it's on the wrong direction. Um, and then just patience. This tool is kind of cool because it's actually a one crimp tool. It actually crimps both the uh, seal and the wire in one crimp. And that's good, uh, but it takes a little bit of patience because for whatever reason, the connector always wants to turn when you have it, when you're trying to crimp, it's trying to rotate instead of get crimped. So in tight spaces, it's definitely patience trying <laughs> to get it right. I found kind of pre-crimping it a little bit with my fingers helped a little bit. Otherwise, I would say I'm super stoked to have this stuff. I still think it's kind of like all over the place. I mean, there's a lot of little parts and blah, 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 but I'm not the judge of that stuff. I'm just the end user. I guess speaking as somebody who doesn't use this stuff every day, I'm kind of surprised that it's, it's such a complicated system. But at the same time, it's extremely simple. And these three are done. I probably will use this on the rear lights. We've got a little bit of repair to do on the excavator. And obviously the harness below the floorboard, that one is repaired for now, I think. This felt good to get this done. It felt good to get that harness done. It felt good to work through this um, weather pack connector thing. I'm glad I got the tool. And you know what? The, I will say one thing. I actually bought two of these tools. One is this one, which came in the kit. And it has these interchangeable dies, which I like. And then it actually crimps both the seal and the wire in one. The other tool I bought has two separate crimpers. So you have to crimp the seal and then you have to crimp the wire. And the reviews that I read said it's more difficult than it sounds. So maybe I made a good decision in just buying the two in one tool in the first place. Of course it came with this kit. It's nice to have an assortment around. I need to find an affordable way to replace what I use though because like I said early in this video, somehow the four pin connector that I bought for this one that's under the floorboard costs half as much as this whole entire kit. So either this is cheap or that's a rip off. Well, I guess my goal today was to get the backhoe up and running and I guess we managed that. I think it'll feel even better once the backhoe is completely repaired. We've diagnosed this ghost, eliminated all the variables and it's super reliable again. One of the reviews that I read, somebody said, if you buy this kit, you're gonna be looking for excuses to wire new harnesses. I don't know if I'm quite to that level, but I'll definitely say it's a lot less intimidating dealing with these weather pack connectors. When you have all the right sizes of bullets, the right sizes of seals, and the right crimping tool, makes this a whole lot easier to deal with than needle nose and making a mess. You guys like me, sometimes you leave a project undone, you go to sleep and hope you wake up in the morning and it just works. I think I'm gonna try that tonight. I almost wonder if the rain that we had yesterday, which was the most rain we've had in a few months, might have got into something and is causing a short, or maybe the more probable reality is that there's one wire that is probably chafing or rubbing on something and it's shorting out and causing this problem. And I can tell you right now, that is not gonna be fun to find. Connector graveyard, meet the fuse graveyard.